Tonight on KQED Newsroom, as deadly mass shootings grip the nation and spark calls for action, we hear from a military veteran whose community was attacked. And bike sharing, it's become a popular mode of transit to get around the city, but these days, good luck finding one. Plus, a beloved music festival celebrates 30 years in San Jose. We'll check out this year's eclectic lineup and how it's stretching the boundaries of jazz. Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Brian Watt. We begin our show with the deadly mass shootings in California, Ohio, and Texas. America has spent the week in mourning after mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton claimed 31 lives in less than a day's time. Gilroy was already reeling from a shooting at its garlic festival a week earlier that claimed three lives. The FBI has opened domestic terrorism investigations into the Dayton and Gilroy shootings, saying in each case that the alleged gunman had explored, quote, violent ideologies. Minutes before he opened fire in a crowded Walmart, the El Paso gunman had posted a manifesto online warning of a, quote, Hispanic invasion of Texas. Joining me now for a perspective on these attacks is a military veteran who hails from one of the communities that was attacked, retired Marine and Gilroy native Richard Ruiz. Welcome, Mr. Ruiz. Thank you for having me, Brian. So I saw a tape of you speaking in Gilroy at the vigil the night after the shooting at the Garlic Festival. And I remember hearing you ask your neighbors if they treat people who are different from them with love. What were you getting at? Well, Brian, at that time, um, I kept thinking about the root of this evil, because it seems like uh, we tended to default to uh, somebody of mental health having access to a weapon and, and being scared and, and vigilant. And, and I kept thinking to myself, wait a minute, are we going to stop this? And if so, what can we do? What do we need to do different? You know, if we look in the mirror and say, okay, what are we doing wrong as a society? We take accountability. What can we do that's different? And really for me, it was that, that demonstrating a sense of, of kind of love and compassion for other people or even just listening to somebody that you may disagree with because that seems to be something that a lot of people don't do nowadays. Hmm. So it's kind of sending that message. You are a Marine Corps veteran. You served in Afghanistan. You are also the son of Mexican immigrants. So in light of the FBI's investigation of these two shootings as acts of domestic terrorism, how have you been thinking about these shootings? So for me, it's really been a interpersonal dilemma because of the dichotomy that I feel that we are experiencing and having homegrown white uh, American terrorists here targeting uh, people who are also American. Hmm. And more importantly, even some who have sacrificed for this country now becoming a target in a place that we swore to defend is, it's really an irony that, that's difficult to, to deal with, you know, and, and kind of comprehend. So, you know, I've thought really deep about what, what is inciting this hate and this violence. Well, what is inciting? I mean, many critics of President Trump say that it's his rhetoric, that it's what he says that encourages white supremacists. I mean, when he says, when he talks about an invasion by immigrants from Mexico, is he talking about your parents? Do you think so? Uh, um, absolutely. I mean, that's that's unfortunately that is that is a part of the way this system has been designed, where you could have someone who enlists and then becomes commissioned in the military and serves honorably, but could be from parents that are immigrants from Mexico. And I, I, I don't want to put all the blame on Trump the way it's easy for people to immediately uh, do, uh, because we know that this racism has been there. But I would argue that, you know, when you do label an entire race as invaders or rapists and, and drug cartel members, you know, it, it, it becomes very difficult to ignore the fact that that may have influenced a person who directly says that uh, he's targeting those that are invading. Mexicans that are invading 
this, the country. So. And that is what we have learned that the gunman in El Paso told law enforcement not long after he was picked up after the shooting at the Walmart in El Paso. You have a friend who is a lot like you from El Paso, also a retired Marine, also having served in Afghanistan, also a son of Mexican immigrants. I think he actually came to this country when he was two years old. He lives in El Paso, and what have you heard from him about how his community has been processing this? So uh, we were in contact immediately, and, and he was telling me that what immediately happened as a result is there was almost this attempt to divide the city mm. between those of Mexican descent and those that are white. And he recognized that, being the good Marine that he is, and immediately addressed it and brought that to the table to, to let everybody know, look, you cannot, just because this person is white, automatically assume or label them as if they are part of the white supremacist agenda. So his reaction, I mean, he was, he was devastated, but his instinct was, all right, how do we stop this? How do we circumvent this type of hate and divisive action? So that was kind of his, his uh, reaction. And he was hurt. I mean, we had a long conversation about how, you know, we served honorably only to come back home, retire to the same type of terrorism that we're fighting overseas. In terms of gun control, because we hear a lot about that in the aftermath of these kinds of shootings, as military veterans who handled firearms in the military, what do you think should be done? So a lot of people aren't going to like what I have to say and because there's no political agenda to this. But for military members such as myself, who had to endure weeks of training, you know, vetting, you know, uh, psychological evaluations, whether or not you can join and handle a weapon, to think that the we this weapon, this, this weapon of war, can easily be purchased through just a simple background check and maybe a function check or safety check, to me is, is a little bit insulting almost because this is a weapon that can cause serious harm. You know, and if we know as a, a military organization and government that, hey, these are the type of this is the type of training that's required, what you, the, the standards you must meet, if we're doing that because we know how dangerous, how important it is, why are we just disrespecting the weapon almost by just giving it to somebody like, a, like if it's a toy? Hmm. Mr. Ruiz, thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, it, I know it's been a difficult couple of weeks, um, but we really appreciate you being with us. I appreciate you having me, Brian. It means a lot. This week, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission said it will fine ride-hailing company Lyft $200,000 for not having enough of its shared bikes available to riders. Lyft is supposed to have a fleet of about 2,000 bikes at docking stations throughout San Francisco. But lately, riders have had a tough time getting their hands on bikes. In April, the company removed about half of its fleet after complaints over braking problems. And just last week, Lyft pulled its new electric assist bikes off the streets after reports of some catching on fire. For the latest on this story, I went out on the street to meet KQED transportation editor Dan Brecky. We're supposed to be talking about the bikes, but you pull up on a scooter. Why is that? Well, we've got a bike shortage here in San Francisco, a shared bike shortage, and I grabbed the nearest two-wheeler. That happened to be a scooter. So the next question is, why do we have a shortage? Right. We have our bike share network. It's run by Lyft. And Lyft has been having some problems the last few months. About three months ago, four months ago, it had braking problems on its electric assist bicycles. Electric assist bicycles, very popular in San Francisco right. because we have hills. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so they had to take a, half of their bikes off the street in San Francisco, meaning there were many fewer. They just introduced a new fleet black bikes with pink wheels. <laughs> and a few days after that, battery fires on those bikes. So they took the bikes off again. Ah. So what we're seeing behind us here yeah. is actually a little unusual, a, a full bike rack. Right. If there had been one where I was, yeah. I would have ridden a bike here. Now, what I also notice about what we're seeing behind us here is a lot of these bikes seem to still have 
Ford signs on them. Some of them say Lyft. Right. But what is Lyft's arrangement with San Francisco and even the rest of the Bay Area? Well, it's a, a, a bit complicated in the history, but it, it, here's, here's what happened. A company called Motivate made an exclusive agreement a few years ago with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. That's the agency that handles funding for, for large transportation projects in the Bay Area. So it's an exclusive agreement that covers San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Berkeley, and Emeryville. Put these nice bikes on the street with these uh, expensive docking stations. They would pick up all the costs and uh, we would enjoy the benefits of these things. But what's happened is there's a little bit of dissatisfaction here in San Francisco because of the bike shortage we described. Hmm. So with this arrangement, do we know how much money Lyft makes? We know we can sort of reverse engineer the numbers and their ridership revenue for this system last year was about $3 million. Lyft is a very big company. It just went public earlier this year. Uh, they spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. In fact, they reported their loss for the most recent quarter just yesterday, and it was close to $900 million just for one quarter. So $3 million isn't real big in the Lyft scheme of things. But it's not just a revenue stream for Lyft. There's a lot more Lyft can get out of this, right? There is a lot more. What they get from their customers is data. So even though it's not personally identifiable data, they get a lot of information about people's travel patterns. Uh, they get people's credit card numbers. They get lots and lots of consumer data that either they want or maybe somebody else wants that they can sell. So long term, that may be the real financial play for companies like Lyft and Uber, which are the two really big players in this whole you know, new mobility sector. So it's not Brian Watts mobility data personally, it is people's it's yours and mine and patterns. all these people walking by us on the sidewalk, right? I mean, anybody who uses these services, that's one thing they're giving up. Uh, they, they can tell where people are going and it actually helps them in their business knowing where they need to serve people, but it also can uh, inform other decisions about consumer behavior and, and where people are going and when and what sorts of services and goods that they're looking for. Do you feel like cities like San Francisco, San Jose, Emeryville have been ready for the presence of cycles, scooters, any of these micro mobility devices that people are using to get around? You know, it's a mixed bag. I think there was a big appetite for the bicycle network, for instance, and it's done in a very controlled way. This system, you actually need a, a docking station and uh, you know people come here and pick up a bike, they drop off a bike, they're not gonna leave it on the sidewalk or something like that. But with both the scooters and dockless bikes, which are coming, we see just a few of those in San Francisco now, people have had a lot more heartache about that or uh, heartburn is probably what I should say because there's been a widespread experience wherever these things have been introduced, of people just leaving the bikes and scooters wherever. And people don't like it, and uh, probably that's something they're not gonna get used to. Now here in San Francisco, with the scooters, the companies that are operating here uh, have actually created a system so that you have to lock up the bike, you have to leash it to something. That usually takes care of the obstruction problem that people don't like. I remember when we first started seeing these bicycles appear in communities, there was a lot of backlash. You saw them being thrown into lakes in some places, and it almost seemed like they were a sign of gentrification. Has that faded? Are they really now becoming more a part of the fabric of communities? Listen, there, there's something corporate about them. As we were saying, Lyft is a really big corporation, and I think there's just sort of an undertone of anti-corporate sentiment among some people in San Francisco, even though we all live in, in, in the shadow of that, right? And, and, right? and that's just something that that's there. But I think for the most part, these things are being accepted. Um, the incidence of vandalism, for instance, on these new bikes that Lyft introduced, the, the ones that started having the battery fires, there's been some vandalism, but not very much. It's something that seems to have uh, calmed down a lot.
So you have talked to a lot of people who ride these bikes regularly. What are they saying about them? Well, about the shortage, they're saying, where are the bikes? When they talk about the system that we have in place, they're going, why is there a monopoly? Can we do something about that? And about the, the bikes themselves, you know, they're clunky. If you're a cyclist, they're heavy. They're not super Tour de France special, but <laughs> they do the job and people really seem to like them. All right, and the cities who have welcomed these bikes, were they ready? Have they gotten more ready for the presence of bikes and even scooters? I think they have. I think the bike share network itself was something that all the cities involved in this really wanted. I think the next wave of the dockless bicycles and the scooters, which people can leave pretty much everywhere, was something that people weren't ready for and have a lot of heartburn over. There's a lot of dislike of uh, seeing these things strewn where people are used to walking. KQED Transportation and Infrastructure Editor Dan Brecky, I call you the master of all that moves. Thank you. You're welcome. The San Jose Jazz Summerfest kicked off this weekend with performances by more than 100 acts spread over 14 stages. Headliners include R&B trio In Vogue and Grammy award-winning vocalist Gregory Porter. Now in its 30th year, the festival also highlights the global appeal of jazz with artists hailing from Colombia, Sweden, and Japan. And for the first time this year, festival goers can flock to a stage dedicated to up-and-coming artists pushing jazz in new musical directions. Joining me now is executive director of San Jose Jazz, Brendan Rawson, and one of the artists performing at the festival, bassist and composer Marcus Shelby. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So first, Brendan, first, 30 years ago, it was eight headliners in a real hope that people would buy lots of beer. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> now you've got 150 yeah. acts, 14 stages. Yeah. So what has changed about mounting a jazz festival? Well, of that scale, you know, it's, uh, it's been um, a big community that comes together every year, basically, to produce that. There's some folks, actually, that did work on that first year that are still involved with the organization. So that institutional knowledge is still present. But to sort of go to 14 stages spread throughout all of downtown, you know, there's streets that we close for stages or indoor venues. Uh, it's, a, it's an undertaking that you know, involves basically the whole community, and good city partners and other, uh, other folks, too. The world has had its ups and downs in 30 years. How has San Jose Jazz survived, and how has it thrived? Yeah, well, we did change that beer business model <laughs> as right. the only source of revenue. So it was originally a free festival. And about 10 years ago, we did adapt into a gated uh, festival, and we kind of range with the diff different levels of being able to purchase a ticket and a general admission or up to VIP. So as a business model, you know, that was something we needed to move in the direction of, but also staying abreast of, you know, the demographics of the Valley and the Bay Area. You know, there's a, always a big amount of churn in our region mm -hmm. and new communities that come in. And I think our programming has really been uh, staying abreast of, uh, of that and staying relevant. And that actually leads me to a question. I want to know who's coming now yeah. and where they come from to this festival. They'll come from all over, that's, that's for sure. We're really excited to have a pretty wide range uh, that we're bringing international acts um, this year, some outstanding folks, uh, Cuban pianist Elio Villafranca that uh, bringing, that's uh, really excited to see. Mm. Great act from Colombia uh, that we're bringing, uh, La Trente Tres, uh, that we saw them uh, about 10 months ago, last October, in Colombia, and started working on getting them here. It wasn't uh, easy to get through the whole visa process, but mm. they got their visas a couple weeks ago, and mm. uh, so they'll be in attendance. So, you know, bringing, bringing from all over, uh, and then also the Bay Area, you know, we're very fortunate, this real sort of embarrassment of riches here, musically, so uh, we have a lot of folks that are regional players that are performing as well. Mm. So this festival mixes in R&B acts you have in vogue. I know yeah. the OJs are also playing this weekend. Um, jazz purists would take issue with that. Um, they would quibble with whether acts like those are real jazz. So what do you tell the purists? 
Well, uh, first of all, it, it's true, right? That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely. The festival actually changed its name. We do go by San Jose Jazz Summerfest, and that's been, I don't know, a close to 10 years ago. And it reflects the variety of music that we're doing. Mm -hmm. now, there'll be Zydeco. There'll be mariachi out there. There's a great uh, Bollywood blues project that uh, uh, performer Aki Kumar is doing this year. So mm -hmm. there certainly is a wide range beyond the, the jazz form that we're presenting. But, also, but jazz, is, it's such a... A, a broad um, realm of music. Um, we do a ton of Latin jazz. There's a swing stage and up and coming things that we call our Jazz Beyond uh, mm -hmm. programming uh, stream that we're they're producing stuff in. So uh, there's an opportunity I think for folks of any interest. Straight ahead fans um, will find a ton of great uh, straight ahead jazz as well. And when you expand to include the worlds of R and B, for example. Is there an economic reason for this, or is it just, hey, if we get people close to what we're doing on the jazz side, maybe they will discover jazz? Yeah, it's um, it's just great music, right? And the, and the crossover, uh, you know, jazz has informed so much of popular American music, right? and you can't really pull those apart uh, in, in ways. So the opportunity to present, present acts that uh, just folks love, you know, and really have a connection to um, American music uh, that's uh, mm. it creates for a great weekend and uh, it's a good business model too. All right, well, <laughs> let's bring in bassist and composer and band leader Marcus Shelby, uh, based here in San Francisco. Let me ask you, are you a jazz purist? Um, I don't call myself that. Mm. I, I love good music. Um, I'm very happy to be on the same stage with the OJs and In Vogue and Snoop Dogg if he was there. And <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and I love um, the type of music that has that sort of diversity. Um, it all comes from one place in this country, the blues. Mm. The music that I play is, is really rooted in the blues, Duke Ellington. Uh, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, uh, and that's the same. Uh, that's the same roots that In Vogue gets their music from. Mm. So to me, I'm not hung up on the word jazz or or who's there. Um, you know, it's all music, and it's all a celebration of this of uh, of the music that has come from this country. Mm. Well, when I listen to your music, I say that is jazz. It's like, it's jazz the way I like to hear it. But for those who aren't familiar with your music, we do have a clip from you and vocalist Tiffany Austin performing last year at San Jose Jazz Summerfest. Let's check it out. Come on, everybody, and lead us on down to the fatal door. Little fella play that squeeze box like you never heard before. When I'm a D sing and play, you know you'll be dancing to that old two sad. And swing it to the blues creole. Nah, nah, nah. Come on, everybody, and be your son. We got a star in town. Folks from the big city came back. Somebody they're gonna lay a record down. I heard they're gonna travel to New Orleans and we dance into that old two step. And swing it to the blue blues creole. Wow, Tiffany Austin, very powerful. Um, you know, Marcus, you are not just involved in this festival, but 
I think three others, mm -hmm. are festivals the way that the jazz flame keeps burning? Are they still essential to the life of jazz? I think it's part of it, and it's a big part of it, because it is probably one of the easiest way to bring a community, a large community together and have diverse groups perform uh, in a block of time. Um, and I've been able to do that with the Hillsburg Jazz Festival, the San Francisco Jazz Festival, and very grateful over the last 20 years off and on with the San Jose Jazz Festival. Mm. So I do remember uh, the, uh, the good old days playing outside in the, when it was, I think, considered the largest outdoor festival in the world, maybe, or at least in the United States. Mm. Um, that's the way that it was built. And so I do think the festival does have a lot of ability to do other things as well, to bring small groups into the community, to do education, to present a, a larger spectrum of artists. Hmm. So when I think about people listening to jazz, people who snap selfies and millennials, they don't really come to mind. Um, is this a challenge today, Brendan? Is, is it a challenge well, reaching out to the young people? I'm particularly feeling excited these, these past couple few years. There's a, a tremendous amount of great energy in jazz young performers that are just exceptionally talented. And they're sort of coming from this hip hop generation. That's the popular music that's informing their tastes and, and interests. And they are feeding it back. You know, so many popular music artists um, are really relying on these great jazz artists to help shape their music. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing it in scenes all over the world. London jazz scene is hopping nowadays and sort of the talk we're fortunate bringing an act from uh, from london this year called sons of kemet that should be pretty cool all right um it's a it's great it's a great time in jazz brendan rawson and marcus shelby thank you very much thank you thank you so much and that'll do it for us to buy tickets to check out marcus shelby and all the other great acts performing this weekend go to summerfest.sanhosejazz.org and as always you can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom i'm brian watt thanks for joining us